Hi, welcome to TVI Tips from Amanda. We're in part two of my series on partnering with paras. And in this part, we've, we're gonna be looking at um, going from having a good job description to fostering the growth and um, knowledge transfer of information for our paraprofessionals and creating some highly qualified individuals. So we know what we need, how do we get there? Um, just want to review what we know so far. We know that good paraprofessionals are go-getters and self-starters. They're able to work independently with minimal guidance once they have the knowledge of the material. They can um, interact with others in a professional manner. They're creative problem solver solvers. They're technologically inclined and extremely difficult to find and hold on to. We know that good paraprofessionals aren't sticking around long term and they're not paid enough. So we're going to look at maybe some ways that we can problem solve those skills. So. Um, we need to justify um, having a qualified paraprofessional that they are unique and have specialized train. They have unique and specialized training. And in Virginia, we need to remember that it's an IEP team decision. It's not just a position that's um, hired and then assigned to random students. Um, one thing that we can do is help our paraprofessionals work towards and obtain the NLS Braille transcription certification. I did include um, that in order to qualify for their enrollment, they must be a high school graduate or citizen, um, also a citizen or resident of the United States or a U.S. citizen residing in a foreign country. And these certifications might be used once they're obtained to justify higher steps on the pay scale, which might also help with their retention of qualified paraprofessionals. I think it's extremely important that the individuals creating our Braille materials are certified or extremely knowledgeable in Braille. They can't just be any Joe Schmo off the street, and they should not be um, creating Braille materials the first day that they're hired. So um, in order to implement some sort of um, evaluation process, we need to have a plan for training and instruction, and we need to progress monitor the skills. So I kind of think of progress monitoring for my paraprofessionals is similar to IEP progress monitoring. I think it's important that we develop some goals and some timelines for when our paraprofessionals will achieve these goals, and then continually check in. I like to check in once a month to um, assess where they are in their goals to make sure that my training is effective and that my paraprofessional is learning what I'm asking them to learn. So we'd like to document the growth or not, keep track of known skills, and justify the time spent on paraprofessional support and training. And I included CYA in here. We want to cover ourselves to make sure that uh, we can't be the ones who are blamed for anything that goes wrong if something goes wrong in the future. So just a little bit here about Braille certification. The NFB offers courses in literary, math, and music, music transcribing, as well as literary and math proofreading for the Library of Congress certification. There are lots of different certifications out there, and I think that it's possible to justify bumps in the pay scale for every certification that's acquired. So the NFB has that for free. You can take the courses for free online. They are listed out here, um, and you can just go to search, Google search NLS Braille certification, and this website will pop up immediately. So you might also justify higher pay by looking at these websites that are linked here in, my prof uh, in this uh, PowerPoint presentation. One is called The Role of the Paraeducator in the Education of Blind Children. It is from Future Reflections of Spring 2002 and it um, is goes in depth on what the role of a paraprofessional is. I think sharing that article with a special education administrator might be helpful in um, look, I have a lot of stuff up on my screen. It might be helpful in justifying higher pay. Um, so you might look at the role of paraprofessionals here and it is loading it. It is a blog post uh, from 2014 by Corb O'Connor, and it just talks more about the role of a paraprofessional. And kind of, he kind of goes into why you can't just take any paraprofessional and have them do something else, and that it's especially special instruction. You have some special instruction required in this position, so that, I think that's pretty important. And then um, we have another article called What Teaching... I'm just going to load here, what teaching assistants and paraeducators do for students who are blind and vision impaired. And this is from familyconnect.org, and it's for parents. But I think it helps explain the different roles that a paraprofessional might have and um, how we balance that role and how we assign them. And I think these three things, if they're shared with special directors, might help them uh, clarify the role and allow you to have some more time to support your paraprofessional. So those are all things that you can look at. I'll include them in the description of my um, YouTube page and I'll also put them on the Facebook page too so you can access those websites. So 
I want to share some purposeful and effective training and um, I have created a form to document, well, to help create a plan for what training needs to be done and to document the specialized skills or training necessary uh, for my paraprofessional. So we're going to pull that up. Here we go. I'm happy to share this with you. It's just something that I created. It has, um, it's called Training Paraprofessionals to Work in the Field of Visual Impairments. It's currently a three-page document subject to growing over time. I would include the paraprofessional name, the year, um, person responsible for the training, and whatever school they're assigned to. And so we look at what training is necessary. Um, does the person need to know about visual impairments? Probably. And which things do they need to know? Then for each um, section, you include approximate time necessary for training and the expected timeline for attainment. So we're looking at what is VI for your student, the etiquette, what O&M skills are necessary, what communication expectations there are, what sort of braille code needs to be trained on, how are we adapting materials, what expanded core curriculum skills need to be learned and so, learned so that they can reinforce, what embossing skills are necessary, and then uh, I like to build in some time in the paraprofessional's workday to practice those skills. Then I summarize all that with other factors for consideration and an outline and discussion of training progression so that I can present um, a well-created plan to special directors and administrators and teams and the paraprofessional when we're looking at training somebody new in our field. So I'm just going to go through one that I did for another paraprofessional. I started partway down the form with the what is a visual impairment. And so what how I fill this form out is I provide one slash mark if it's an area that my paraprofessional needs to be trained in and then I slash through it to make an X when that has been obtained. And so this paraprofessional that we're looking at on this slide has um, some experience in the field specifically with my student. So I don't need to review the student's visual impairment including the most recent functional. I don't need to talk about the implications of the visual impairment on near distance and far distance tasks. I will include the most recent functional um, and the IEP in the packet that I give this paraprofessional but it's not something that that person needs direct instruction on. So um, I'm sorry I am going to go over the IEP at a glance including the goals accommodations and services which is written there and I'm going to provide Provide my paraprofessional with tools and progress monitoring goal sheets for the goals that I want that paraprofessional to also track IEP data on. So I thought that because this person already has the basic knowledge, I would provide that person with an hour before the start of the school year. And so we did that and it went very well. As far as etiquette, this particular individual, I also said, has been working with this student before, so I didn't feel that there was a need to go through etiquette, but we have some great things here. Um, and I'm going to include my handouts for etiquette in another part of the series, but um, we might look at just little things like you need to introduce yourself by name, looking at the 19 ways to step back, uh, how can we reinforce the fact that independence is key, and then maybe some training on hand under hand instead of hand over hand prompting. Uh, then I would include the approximate time necessary for training and the expected timeline for attainment. For o &M skills to reinforce for this particular student, she travels independently extremely well. Um, she only needs some minor prompting to reinforce known cane techniques, and my paraprofessional knows those already, so I didn't need to provide any additional training for o &M skills to reinforce. For communication expectations, I did want to develop a chain of command for issues that arise for this student, so I marked that off and we met together the administrator at the school in charge uh, responsible for this student, myself, um, and well, I, I was actually just training this paraprofessional, I'm not her TBI, so the TBI for the student and myself met to talk about the chain of command for issues that arise and um, what communication that paraprofessional should be making, if any, with family um, the student, the team, you know, what, what our expectations were for that. We did that before the start of the school year. Um, by, and I haven't, I'm not sharing the updated form, but once we did this, I changed the slash into an X so that we could show that we had done that um, as we were saying that we needed to do. On the second page, we're looking at what training in the Braille code is necessary for this individual. So um, this individual needed some instruction on contracted Braille, which I'm looking at UEB. Um, but I'm just calling it contracted braille for whatever reason. It's how it's written on here. She's also, this student is learning uh, UEB technical, so we're looking at math in UEB. We're looking at um, some support on the braille note takers, which is the braille note, and then troubleshooting um, the brailler because she needs some assistance with that. So we're starting 
her school year at two hours a week and the plan to reduce that over time and we'll talk in a subsequent video of what the two hours a week of braille instruction looks like for this particular individual and we actually came back and amended this from two hours a week to four hours a week and my goal was for her to know um, UEB math and UEB technical math by the end of the first semester. Um, just to go back for one second, uh, this is a goal uh, and an expected timeline for attainment, but when you're providing good progress monitoring, you might come back and say, well, the paraprofessional is not learning it as quickly as I expected, so let's um, adapt and addend this expected timeline and change that. So um, this is not something that's set in stone. It's just a plan and it's good to have a plan that you stick with when you're training somebody. So then we have the uh, section for adapting materials. This individual is adapting math assignments and then creating tactile graphics, graphs, etc. So she needs some training on that. She, um, I did provide her with a toolkit of materials for adaptations including wiki sticks, puppy paint, etc. And I did train her on how to, or I planned to train her on how to describe videos, presentations, demonstrations, and pictures with enough detail and in, a, in an appropriate way. And so my plan for this was to start at about a half an hour of week, a week for um, these sorts of things and then reduce it over time. And I wanted her to be independent in those skills by the end of the first semester. So for expanded core curriculum skills for this particular student, she's just working on JAWS right now. Her abacus cafeteria, most of the ECC is going really well. She's a, a high school student. So I wanted my paraprofessional to learn JAWS. And so we were starting with half an hour a week of JAWS instruction for my para, this particular paraprofessional with an attainment of knowing the basic JAWS commands by the end of the first quarter. Finally, we're looking at embossing. This is an area that this paraprofessional needed a lot of support in. She uh, ultimately will be responsible for um, creating all of the braille for this particular student. Right now she's not because she doesn't know it, by the way. So we're looking at training on embossing software used by the school district, um, including for math and technical materials. We're looking at um, how do you format that information once you're getting it onto the computer? There are specific guidelines for formatting. How are we, um, we need to make sure she's editing and looking at what she's typed up to make sure it's being brailled correctly and then how to create tactile graphics and graphs. So that will be included with other training time and will be completed by the end of the first semester. And finally, I mentioned before, I like to have time for my paraprofessionals to be able to practice the things that we're working on. So in addition to the training that I'm providing, I'm recommending an hour each school day for time to product, practice adapting materials. Sometimes I would have the pair professional adapt something that I'm adapting at the same time. And then we come back and look at the differences between what she did and what I did. And sometimes her stuff is better. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes mine's better. But we can work together as a team and talk about why I did certain things and why she did certain things and why it's correct or maybe not correct. And then time to practice transcribing my students' work from Braille to print. She does have a Braille note, but some things she likes to do in physical paper Braille. So it's important that my pair professional be able to go from my students to create materials to print for the teachers. And then time to practice embossing materials using six key entry as well as with the QWERTY keyboard because sometimes you do need to use a Perkins Brailler to create materials. And so then I just have an outline and discussion of the training progression here um, with my plan of starting and then reducing the time. So now that we have a plan, um, I recommend creating a paraprofessional training packet. So in video three, we're going to talk about what I include in my paraprofessional training packet. And then video four is going to talk about how we actually implement the training for our, um, how I implement the training for my paraprofessional. So hopefully video two has been helpful for you and uh, you look forward to checking out video three. And I'm going to figure out how to stop it.